Hi, I'm James Catherall, co-founder of Catherall Audio. Today we're talking about the best ways to conserve CPU power while building your main stage concerts. When building and programming main stage concerts, it's important to be responsible when selecting the plugins you use and how you'll utilize them. You want to make sure your concerts will run consistently and won't crash or cause issues during a performance. It's one thing to build your concert at home or in your office and have it be reliable, and it's another thing entirely to have a concert that can perform the same in a real-world setting. This means being aware of your CPU and RAM usage in your concert. Let's talk about what things to keep in mind when building your main stage concerts. The first thing to keep in mind as we go through this video, nothing we're about to discuss is black and white. There's not a plugin that you should never use, and there's not a plugin that you should always use instead. This process is about risk assessment. This assessment will be based on your computer, where your performances happen, how long your performances will be, and what type of sounds you need to create. A stronger computer can obviously handle more intense plugins compared to an older, weaker computer. If your performances happen outside in the middle of the day and last over an hour, then you'll have different considerations in mind. Now that I've said that, there is one thing in your concerts that you should always have turned on, your CPU and RAM meters. There are three places to get this set up. The first is in the preferences. Go to the display tab under preferences and check this box. The meters will appear at the top of your concert. These are important to keep an eye on while performing, especially the CPU meter. If this meter is hitting the red, then you're pushing your CPU too hard and you need to look at removing things from your concert or making changes to how it's set up. You can double click the meter and a pop-up window will open up that'll give you more detailed information on which plugins are using the most resources. They've made it quick and easy to understand by color coding the different plugins you're using and putting the legend down here at the bottom of the window. The next area is on the upper left side in the patch list. Click this circle with three dots to open up the drop down menu. Move down to the display options and make sure the show memory usage option is checked. RAM usage in a main stage concert stays pretty consistent compared to CPU usage, which will jump around based on how much you're playing at that moment. You can think of the RAM like an empty box. The more RAM you have, the larger this box will be and the more plugins you can fit inside of it. This is something important to keep in mind when deciding how much RAM you want on your computer. More RAM equals more plugins in your concert. The final area to keep track of RAM usage is on the right side in the channel strip window. Right click one of your channel strips and hover over channel strip components on the drop down menu and then make sure the memory usage option is checked. This will display how much RAM each individual channel strip is using, while the patch list option will show how much RAM the patch as a whole is using. These are good to have turned on so you can see how much RAM is being used at a quick glance. Sometimes you'll build a concert and notice that one patch is using like one or two gigs of RAM, and then you can take a closer look at it to see if there's some things that you can change. Now this goes back to risk assessment. You may have a single patch that is really large in your concert, but you may determine that for your specific use case, it's important to have everything set up in that patch the exact way it is, and you can leave it alone, and that's fine. Next, let's talk about concert stability. Using third-party plugins will make your concert inherently less stable. Third-party software is anything that is not developed by Apple themselves. So the ES2 and Multisampler are first-party, whereas Omnisphere or Contact are third-party plugins. Adding these can cause issues because they don't have access to the same resources and source code that an in-house Apple developer has to make the plugin communicate and play nice within the Apple hardware and software architecture. When people tell you not to update your computer operating system or your main stage app, it's because it can break the compatibility with your third-party software. Apple will usually make sure all first-party software is stable when they release an update or will put it as a high priority to fix any bugs that pop up. But with a third-party plugin, it can be anywhere from a month to over a year before software will be compatible with a new update. Now, back to the disclaimer from earlier in the video. I'm not saying you shouldn't use third-party plugins in your concert. I personally make heavy use of third-party plugins when creating my concerts. You just need to keep the risk assessment in mind when you add them. And your mileage may vary depending on which third-party plugins you make use of. 
For the next part of the video, we're going to operate under a blanket rule of thumb. When we create a concert, we want to try and use the least amount of instances of a plugin as possible. Every time you create a new instance of a plugin, even if it's a plugin you're already using somewhere in your concert, it uses up more resources from your computer. Now this can get confusing since everything in main stage is virtual. Let's try to think of it in terms of something physical. Let's say you have a group of people all traveling to the same destination. You can all take separate cars to arrive at that destination, but that can make things complicated. So the easier solution is to have everyone get into the same car to get to this destination. We're going to try to stick with that line of thinking as we're working to reduce the amount of plugins that we use. Now, there are a lot of different ways that we can achieve this so that limiting the amount of plugins doesn't limit our creativity in the type of sounds we make. The first one is for FX plugins. Reverbs and delays are very common plugins in a concert. If we use a new instance of a plugin every time we want a reverb on a channel strip, that can quickly add up and put a lot of pressure on your computer's resources. So we're going to use what's called a send instead. You'll find the sends underneath the audio effects section on your channel strip. Click and hold this empty rectangle to add a new send. Select a bus and then release and it'll create an aux channel strip. Load the reverb or delay here and dial in the settings the way that you want them. Then you can increase the send amount to the aux channel strip. In basic terms, this will increase the amount or volume of the affected sound. In this example, that will increase the volume of the reverb on this particular channel strip. Now, for any future channel strips that I add, I can send them to this same bus with the reverb plugin instead of creating multiple new reverb instances on each channel strip. I used a reverb for this example, but you can use this for any plugin that you know you'll be using often throughout your concert. If you only use a plugin once, then it's okay to place it right on the channel strip, but anything used more than once should be used as a send. Next, let's move on to alias channel strips. Like Ascend, these are useful when you want to use a specific channel strip or sound in multiple different patches. For example, something common like a piano. You have a piano channel strip that you want to use multiple times throughout a concert. If you just copy and paste this, then this doubles the plugin and doubles the load on your computer. So instead, I'm going to create an alias channel strip. You can think of an alias like an empty channel strip that is telling Mainstage to reuse the channel strip from a different patch. It doesn't increase the load on your computer because it's not adding any new plugin instances. To create one, I'll first add a second patch to my concert. Then on this first patch, I'm going to select this channel strip and copy it. On the second patch, I'll go to the Edit drop-down menu and select Paste as Alias, or press Option Command V. You'll know you did it right if you see this green arrow at the top of the channel strip. You can imagine that it's pointing you back to the original channel strip, and you can actually click on it and it'll take you back to the patch with the original channel strip. Now, because it's attached to the original channel strip, any changes you make to the alias will also change the original channel strip and vice versa. The only things that you can change independently are the expression, pan, fader, MIDI input, and any layer editor changes. The last one is one of the lesser used features inside of Mainstage, and that's the multi-output feature, or sometimes called multi-timbral. I use this feature most often with the multi-sampler, contact, and omnisphere. You can select it when you're loading the plugin. When I hover over the multi-sampler, I can select mono, stereo, or multi-output. I can tell it's a multi-output instrument because it has these plus and minus buttons underneath the level meter. I'll talk about what those do in a second. First, let's open up the multi-sampler interface and load a couple samples. Next, I'm going to create a second group and put this snare sample in there. Under the Group tab, I'm going to change the output of Group 2 to Output 3-4. Now back to the channel strip. I'm going to press this plus button, and it looks like it's adding a new channel strip, but this is still connected to the sampler plugin. But we can see at the top it says SAM 3-4. The main output of the sampler is on the original channel strip, and group 2 of the sampler is being sent to this new channel strip. Now I can add a separate EQ and processing to these samples, even though they're all contained inside one instance of the multi-sampler. Let's do something obvious so we can easily hear what's going on. I'm going to put a delay on this snare sample. You can hear that it's only being applied to the snare sample, but not to the kick sample. 
I can also change the sends, the pan, or even the outputs so it can be routed somewhere different on my mixer. Now, as I said at the beginning of the video, there are no black and white rules when it comes to building an efficient main stage concert. It's all about risk assessment and taking your own circumstances into account when deciding how to build your concert. It's important to get creative with how you make your concert so it can run reliably and so you don't end up getting limited on the creativity of sounds you can produce. That's it for this one. If you like this video, go ahead and give it a thumbs up. Make sure to subscribe and we'll see you in the next one.